the band was what I would call middle class musicians. The royalties from records kept accruing to the members of the band. In 2000, something called Napster happened. And Napster was the first pirate site which put all the music in the world out for free. And literally the royalty stream from records just stopped. This just seemed incredibly unfair. And so I began to think about, well, how could it be that the creative class, the kind of core of what people search on Google for or listen to, are getting screwed, and yet a few companies are making more money than any companies have ever made in the history of America. The internet was going to be this winner-takes-all business that it needed to have no regulation. It had to be free of government regulation, which is, of course, a libertarian idea. There should be no copyrights. So YouTube is a system built on the idea that the copyright holder, the musician or the record company, has no right to take their content off of YouTube. And finally, that there should be no competition. So what happened to the people who were creating the content that fed these systems? If you look at the music business, since Napster arrived, it's fallen by 72% revenues. It's just that all the money got reallocated from the people who made the content to the people who own these monopoly platforms. So what is the effect of this on a musician? So as I said, Google makes the proposition to the music business, your content is going to be on YouTube whether you want it to or not. The only thing you have to decide is, do you want some of our advertising money? And when I say some, it's a very small amount of money. As you can see, YouTube has almost 60% market share in the streaming audio business. You think that Spotify is the largest streaming audio player. It's not even close. YouTube, every single tune in the world, is on YouTube for free. As both Facebook and YouTube and Google have what is called a safe harbor. And that is a law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act which makes it impossible to sue Facebook or Google or YouTube for anything. The notion being that they don't really control their platforms. They're just a, a conduit, and they can't have any control over what goes on it. This, of course, is a big lie. So if you were lucky enough as a musician to have a tune that was popular, and you could get a million downloads on iTunes, you would make $900,000. If you had a million streams on YouTube, you would make $900. Before the internet, if you were a distributor, your basic plan would be to aggregate the best content suppliers you could find. And if you had the best content, then the audience would find you. But what Facebook and Google did was flip that on its head. They basically decided that they would go out and aggregate the audience. Then they said to the people who make content, like the New York Times or anybody else, if you want to reach these 2 billion users, you have to come through us, and here's the deal. We're going to decide how you split the advertising revenue. And I saw firsthand the monopoly influence these companies have. The commissioner, registrar of copyrights at the Library of Congress last year convened a series of hearings that I participated in and Facebook and Google and YouTube and everybody else participated in to determine whether this safe harbor thing, which protects YouTube and Google and Facebook from any prosecution from people who don't want their content on their systems, um, whether that should be changed. And she reached the conclusion that it should be changed. And three days later, she was fired.